Well, welcome back to the Vicarage study. Uh, what we decided to do, because the, the stream went a bit wrong uh, during the Sunday service, we decided to just uh, fill in the sermon by uh, putting it in, uh, uh, re-recording it in the study. So um, we are back in Ezra this week, looking at the return of the exiles. And do you remember last week, Belshazzar, uh, king of Babylon, was having this huge party, drinking, mocking God by, uh, by taking uh, all the sacred chalices and the cups from the temple that uh, were used to worship God in the temple and using them to drink toasts to all the Babylonian gods. And in the middle of this party, if you remember, uh, a hand appears and writes on the wall four words. And this is what it writes. Mene, mene, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. Passing, your kingdom will be divided and given to the Persians. And of course the hand was right. God allowed the Persians to conquer Babylon and Belshazzar was overthrown. And then uh, God moved Cyrus, the new king's heart, uh, to let God's people return to Judah and start to rebuild their lives and start to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. And so the exiles returned, just like uh, we've returned to our building, although I know we're not in it now. And um, so all of that happened last week in Ezra 1 and 2. And now we get to Ezra 3 and God's people have settled back down in Judah and they start the big rebuild. Remember, they're going to rebuild the temple and everything in it so it can be used to worship God and to draw other people into uh, the worship of God as well. So where do they start? Well, where do you start when you build a temple? Tell you what, let's have a look. Building a temple? But where do you start building a temple? Well, how about the doors so you can get in? No, 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 wait, what are you going to attach them to? And what about if it rains? Maybe start somewhere else. That's better. The roof will keep the rain off. But what's going to hold the roof up? Ah, the walls. That's a good idea. Where are you going to put them? No. No. Uh, no. Look, don't you remember that sermon I did on the 14th of June in lockdown? You don't? Okay. Well, here's a reminder. Those foundations gives us a almost a, a building manual spec. In fact, the Collins Complete DIY Manual, always a handy book to have around just to check uh, and show you my bookshelves are real. Uh, here it is. Uh, and uh, I quote from it uh, because it's the kind of book I read uh, at bedtime. This is uh, so uh, crucial. It says building foundations is the crucial starting point when it comes to building a house. The foundations carry the whole weight of the house. Cost cutting on foundations could lead to structural issues down the line. So make sure you set aside a healthy contingency budget at this stage. There's some advice if you're building a house. Uh, don't skimp on the foundations. So that's it, the foundations. That's where to start, isn't it? They hold everything else up. But actually, the Israelites did something else before building the physical foundations of the temple. Before doing that, they worked on the spiritual foundations. Now, that doesn't mean imaginary foundations like built of clouds or something. Um, no, what they did first was to make sure their relationship with God was sorted. Chapter 3 of Ezra tells us how they did that. Chapter 3, verse 3 says this, Despite their fear of the people around them, they built the altar and sacrificed offerings on it to the Lord. So they were worried uh, because there were still lots of people around them who didn't want them there, who didn't want them uh, worshipping God and rebuilding the temple. 
But even though they were scared, they carried on. So, even though they were scared, they built an altar. And they got animals. And they sacrificed them. Now you see, the idea was that they knew that they needed to be forgiven because they turned away from God. They rejected him. They said, we don't want you. And the way they did that back then was to swap with an animal. They say, God, you should be angry at me rightly because I've turned away from you and I've rejected you. But I'm going to sacrifice this animal as a way of showing that I know I've done wrong and the animal is going to take the, the rap for me, take the punishment for me. Now, that's not very fair on the animal, is it? Of course. Uh, but also they had a problem because they would have had to keep doing it. One animal could never forgive all of their sins. So that's why the first thing they did was to build an altar, even before laying the foundations of the temple. Now, the question is, what's the first thing we should do? Just like God's people then, we've returned to our building. It's still standing, so we don't need to rebuild it, though it does need a lot of work doing to it. But what's the first thing we should do? Well, don't worry, it's not reaching for a guinea pig because the difference between God's people then and God's people now is that the one sacrifice has been made once and for all time. There's been a sacrifice made so that no other sacrifices ever need to be made to bring us back to God. Because instead of all those animals, Jesus said, I'll do it. I will be the sacrifice. I will go to the cross and I will die so that everything, everything you've ever done in the past, present and future that stops you being close to God can be forgiven. Once and for all time. No more sacrifices needed because it's paid for. That's why we don't have altars in churches now. Now, that's confusing because often we still call uh, that thing in the centre of church the altar. Uh, but actually, uh, it isn't an altar. It's the Lord's table because we don't make sacrifices there. That's not what communion is. Uh, we don't have to get a guinea pig or even get some bread and wine and sacrifice it to God to make things OK between us. No, at the Lord's table, we have a meal. We eat bread and we drink wine to remember and to celebrate that Jesus has made that once for all time sacrifice for us. That it's done. And that we, through him, can be forgiven. That's our spiritual foundation. And that's the foundation of this church and the foundation of our lives. So that all we do is, is saying thank you to Jesus for what he's done for us. We love Jesus, as the Bible says, because he first loved us and gave himself for us. Let's think about our lives this week. What things about the way we live show thankfulness to God for what Jesus has done? And so as we return to our building, to St Andrews, and as we carry on looking through the book of Ezra over the next weeks, now guinea pigs are just for cuddling. And bread and wine is just for celebrating uh, so that we don't have to do endless things to work our way to God. Jesus is the way to be close to him. And so just like God's people back then, whatever people think around us, we're going to worship him. And now we're going to do that by reminding ourselves of the truth that it's in Christ alone that we can come to God.